everyone hello hello out into the internet um it is great to be with everyone thank you for sharing your time with us this evening my name is ebony johnson kaba i serve as the engagement manager wait hold on let me make sure we're live y'all Okay, we're live. Thank you, Ralph. <laughs> uh, I serve as the engagement manager for Black Public Media. Um, and we are just honored tonight to have you here with us um, celebrating this little this little light of mine in space, our creator chat. Um, I am calling to you in from the unceded lands of the Wichita, Kickaboo, Cato, and Tribes and Bands. That is Dallas, Texas. Um, and before we introduce our wonderful guest this evening, I wanted to give you kind of a quick overview of how you can participate with us tonight. Um, we are streaming live from Black Public Media's YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram channel. Um, later on in the conversation, we'll open up for Q&A, so you can actually ask us questions or share comments with us. Um, typing in the chat or the comment section of those uh, social channels. So. Make sure you are participating with it. We would love to have you kind of involved with us this evening. Um, so tonight we are celebrating the vision project of this little mind, this little light of mine in space, led by the beloved director, producer, and writer Topper Carew. And we are honored tonight by the company, the additional company of Tierra Fletcher aerospace engineer, author, and co-founder of Rocket with the Fletchers. Um, I'm excited. I'm thrilled to introduce our moderator for tonight's conversation, Mr. Ralph Bouquet, uh, Director of Education and Outreach at NOVA, the PBS science documentary series produced by GBH in Boston. At NOVA, Ralph and his team support science educators through the creation of free classroom resources and engage new audiences for NOVA's broadcasts and digital productions through inclusive science communication events across the country. Their newest initiative, the NOVA Science Studio, offers high school students the opportunity to learn science journalism and short form video production while reporting on issues in their communities. Before NOVA, Ralph taught high school biology and chemistry in Philadelphia and worked in ed tech at Boston-based startup. Uh, Ralph received his BA from Harvard University and studied secondary science methods in urban education while completing his master's of edu education at UPenn. Ralph currently lives in Atlanta, Georgia with his wife and son. So everybody, please help me welcome Mr. Ralph Bouquet. Hey, Ralph. Hi, Ebony. Thank you all so much for, for uh, joining us today. I'm so excited to be here um, and to enjoy this excellent and really exciting conversation uh, about this uh, really inspiring project. And so, um, yeah, thank you for having me. Of course. I'm going to pass the floor to you, sir. All right. Well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm really excited today because we are going to be talking. Uh, we have a great panel lined up to discuss uh, this little uh, light of mine and space project, uh, but also to have a broader conversation too about um, space science, about sort of our different passions and inspirations that folks have uh, for doing this work. Um, this little light of mine is such a really inspiring and interesting project. It is a payload, which is a container um, that is sent up to the International Space Station. And inside of that payload um, is a small TV studio, which is broadcasting a film back to Earth. And this film is entitled This Little Light of Mine. It basically features uh, children's choirs from around the world singing uh, the classic uh, gospel song, This Little Light of Mine. Um, and we're, uh, I think we're gonna play actually a quick trailer to show you what that's all about. So uh, Ebony, if you can go ahead and play that trailer so we can watch, uh, this little teaser of this really exciting uh, project. The 
Today, I'm really excited for this conversation because we are joined uh, by several really inspiring people. Uh, the first being Topper Carew. Uh, Topper was born and raised in Boston, uh, and he began his post secondary education at Howard University School of Architecture, earning a bachelor's in architecture and a master's in environmental design from Yale. Uh, he has held fellowships at MIT and the Corporation of Public Broadcasting. He started his film career by making documentaries about the relationship between neighborhood people and architecture and has produced eight national television series, 15 documentaries, four theatrically released films, 15 movies for television, and 300 live concerts. He is the recipient of more than 40 film and television awards and eight gold medals for design. He was also a former GBH program manager production uh, producer and it includes credits for Say Brother, uh, one of the longest running uh, Black Public Affairs uh, television series, Tonight from Harvard Square, and several national PBS series. He left GBH to found Rainbow Television Workshop, an independent production company that produced content for PBS, HBO, Showtime, Nick, and the Disney Channel. And his work has aired in primetime on ABC, NBC, BET, Fox, TNT, TV One, and MTV. His theatrically released films include DC Cab and Breaking and Entering, and his primetime television series, which I'm sure you all have heard of, Martin uh, on Fox, is considered one of the most popular black television series of all time. In 2012, Topper was named a research scholar at the Lifelong Kindergarten Lab at the MIT Media Lab. And with technology as an added tool, he is researching and developing new storytelling modalities and new film, animation, and video production methodologies. So please, everyone, welcome Mr. Topper Carew. Topper, it's so great to have you with us. Oh, Topper, I think you're muted. <laughs> All right, there we are. Thank, th thank you. That's why I love young people, because young people can tell me when I'm muted. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Awesome. So happy to have you here, Topper. Um, our other guest tonight uh, is none other than Tierra Fletcher. Tierra Fletcher is the co-founder of Rocket with the Fletchers, published author of Wonder Woman of Science and I Can Be book series and an aerospace engineer serving as program manager and site project engineer working on groundbreaking space efforts for Maui, Hawaii at a top aerospace company. Fletcher's fascination with space began at a young age, leading her to obtain a degree in aerospace engineering at MIT. At MIT, her exceptional talent and passion for innovation shone through as she worked on various projects, including the design of NASA's space launch system. With a passion for space and people development, she wanted to receive a Master of Engineering Management from Duke and is pursuing a Doctor of Education in Organizational Change and Leadership from the University of South Carolina. Fletcher believes that if you can dream it, you can achieve it. Welcome, Ms. Tierra Fletcher. Thank you so much for having me, Ralph. I am so happy to be here and definitely to be down with the topper. Awesome, awesome. Uh, well, this is just so exciting. I think um, you know this project has really, really piqued my interest um, because I think it combines uh, so many things that I enjoy: space, music, um, connecting with people. Um, and so, Topper, I would love to just get into your head about this project. Can you tell us um, more about your vision for this little light of mine in space? Why were you inspired to do this project, 
And how exactly do you get a payload to the ISS? Well, uh, I was invited to uh, China because I'm an architect and a technologist and, you know, know a lot about things like uh, food growth systems, the manufacture of water, you know, uh, robotic housing, uh, foldable vehicles, transportation vehicles. So I know a lot of stuff. And uh, a close friend of mine, you know, who was in China, you know, who has been a colleague of mine since uh, the early 70s, kept bugging me about coming to China. And he and I had uh, founded early on something called the uh, U.S. Sino uh, Cultural uh, Commission. And uh, so he was bringing Chinese artists and musicians to Washington, D.C., and then China fell in love with him. It just happened that his brother was uh, Philip Kotler, who was, who was one of the fathers of marketing in the world. And so my friend Milton introduced marketing to China and was building cities uh, in China and Vietnam. And he kept saying, hey, Top, listen, come on over to China, man. I wouldn't come. So he would send delegations to see me to say, come to China. So finally, I gave in, went to China to explore, you know, doing a Mars colony, which I thought would be an exciting and interesting idea. And uh, my interest was in developing technologies and building them that could eventually be, you know, uh, employed in our urban areas in America, you know, to improve the quality of life there. So, China's cool, man. You know, I like the Chinese food in Chinatown and Boston better, to be to be realistic. I had a lot of banquets, a lot of handshakes, man. You know, a lot of bows. And, you know, it was it was kind of cool being in China. And they, they weren't even thinking about me being black, man. They were just thinking about me having the knowledge and they wanted the knowledge. But at the same time, I said, well, listen, why should I give all that knowledge away when it could be better employed in you know, in this country, in the interest of our inner city communities. So I told the, the folks I had met on the way, I said, look, uh, I, I, that's my daughter on the phone. So I said, look, I don't want to do that. I want to do something else. I got to be real honest with you. And, you know, we developed a very cool relationship. I said, well, here's what I want to do. I want to do a, a film called This Little Light of Mine. Now, why did I want to do that film? I wanted to do that film because, you know, I had been a, an activist and had been in Mississippi as a voter registration worker, you know, and I was stationed with my college roommate, you know, a half a mile from where they dumped uh, Emmett Till's body in the, in the Delta. And one of the women that I met there who joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, of which I was a member, was a woman named... Fannie Lou Hamer. She had been a timekeeper on a, a on a plantation in Rollsville, Mississippi, and, and she was a mature woman. And she joined the movement. And when we would have rallies, you know, getting ready to launch a campaign, would be in the church. She'd stand in front of us, and she would sing "This Little Light of Mine." And that song has been in my heart and memory forever. So I said, "Look." Here's what I want to do. I want to make a film of children's choirs around the world singing this little light of mine. And, you know, I want to put it up on the International Space Station. So we designed a television studio that was the size of a shoebox, which would make it possible because the film was in that studio. And then uh, we sent the proposal to the person who was going had to green light the project. Well, it happened to be a brother in... Uh, Dubai, who I'd helped in LA when he was trying to get his, his career going. And so he got it. He saw my little piece of paper and he said, Topper. He said, oh, oh hell yeah. Topper will get it done. So next thing I know, I had the green light. And the only problem from there was, you know, how's this thing going to get paid for? So I didn't tell my children that I was going into my savings account to pay for this. Because, you know, I knew they would be upset, but, uh, you know, given my strong faith, uh, you know, I did it. So I, I wrote the check and it happened. And so we went up on, wow. on January 30, man. 
and the uh, they, the astronauts unloaded it last night. So when you go to the website, this little light of mine in space, you you'll see it, man. Now the motivation, you know, is the same motivation that made me go to Mississippi, you know, and be a voter registration worker, and has made me be an activist for all of my life. You know, I got a PhD, but you know, I'm an activist, man, and you yeah. know. I felt that there is a lot of darkness going on in the world right now. And it would be a good thing to be able to send some light into the world. You know, some, mm -hmm. and, and so when you see the film, man, you'll see the messages of love, peace, joy, hope, cooperation, friendship. And, you know, so, you know, people who've seen the trailer, man, have given me some good reportage. You know, people have told me they cried, teared up. People have told me they smiled. People told me they were having a bad day and they watched this little trailer. You know, that's and then they then they see the film that's gone up, man, and they feel good. That's all I want. Oh, well, thank you so much, Topper. I mean, that that really is inspiring. And I, I think, you know, what's what's really exciting about sort of this experience is that um, on the website, there is a tracker. So when uh, you can actually track where the, the payload is and um, when it is in your area, you can actually tune in uh, via that link to actually see that video broadcast from that studio, which is uh, such an incredible feed. Um, so, so thank you for sharing that. And, and one, one last thing, uh, the tracker will let you know when it's coming over your location. If it's at night, you look up in the sky, it's the third brightest star in the sky. You know, it's light shining down on you, brother. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you so much, Topper. Um, I mean, this is just really, really exciting. And and when I think about sort of the work um, that it takes to you know to do these things to get things up to the ISS, um, Tierra, I'm really sort of inspired by sort of how you have worked on these systems. And so I know you know you worked on the design of NASA's uh, space launch system. Can you tell us a little bit about what excites you about the prospect of these new technologies to get us into space. I know there's some exciting news today with some um, stuff that's been landing on the moon and, and, and things are, are, are looking are looking up. Uh, so can you speak to us about sort of what, what inspires you, what excites you about these new technologies and these opportunities to get us into space? Absolutely. Space exploration excites me because of really what Topper was just talking about, bringing different opportunities, technologies, innovations into our communities is because of the space program of yesterday that we have memory foam today that we're able to use GPS. Um, so breaking the barriers of what's, you know, your typical media avenues as what Topper just did by literally launching a film into space is fascinating to me. So what does it take to do that? It takes a very large rocket. I worked on NASA's space launch system, um, which was launched via the Artemis program. You may have heard about that back in 22. And for that particular program, it was significant because it was our milestone into getting closer to Mars. We're returning to the moon and then going to Mars. So it takes a similar avenue in order to launch a payload. You need a very large rocket in order to do so. You need enough thrust to overcome gravity to then launch the payload into space, connect to the International Space Station. And like Topper just gave the news about, the astronauts were able to open that gift and actually see that there is a film inside of that payload container. And then we're sending data back and forth between the International Space Station and Earth so that we're able to literally look at the film as it's being shown in the International Space Station. So it means to me that we are coming into a space where we are able to provide more representation through media within space. When we talk about what the space look like in the future, it looks equitable. Right. It looks like a visionary fiction of what it can be versus what it currently is. We've learned so many things here on Earth when it comes to equal opportunity, and we have a long way to go. And we plan to expand that space inside of space by bringing the first woman, by bringing the first person of color onto the moon, into deeper avenues of space and projects such as what Topper is in charge of is what gets us closer to that. So thank you for your contributions, Topper. Uh, I'd like to say I'm, I'm uh, very proud of you because uh, I realize how few black astrophysicists there are. And so one of the things that I wanted to 
do with this project is to encourage and, and possibly inspire, you know, young people who look like us to begin to contemplate that as a possibility. So the fourth window on the uh, website, you know, begins to explain some of the stuff that's involved in making, you know, all of this happen. You know, and, and, and the other thing is, you know, uh, beyond, you know, trying to spirit people, you know, make people feel good, just like Fannie Haber used to make us feel strong and brave and courageous before we went out on our campaigns in the South. I want I want young people to just be touched by it, you know, and and I want their parents to be touched by it. And I want people to know, you know, as a consequence of the of the of what I have done, that it is possible. You know, we just have to, you know, have the dream and recognize that, you know, hope is a factor and, you know, hope, you know, um, is is too strong to be killed, you know, and hope is really a possibility and that, you know, uh, I've had, I had to have, I had some sleepless nights, you know, I had to, I had to get up some courage, man, to write that check and, you know, but, you know, courage is just around the corner and you got to, you got to call on it. But at the same time, my faith is very strong. And so that's what oftentimes has propelled me. So, you know, I want other people to realize that they can be and they can do what I've done. You know how you, you know how it is when somebody gets on the block with that new pair of sneakers, you know, other people want them. And so, you know, I want other people to do what I've done and I want other people to follow my example in that, you know, I'm the philanthropist. You know, I didn't go someplace with a cup in my hand. You know, I had the cup. And so I want other people to follow that example about, you know, building and fortifying and strengthening our community by making commitments to it and and in it. And so uh, they say, I'm, I don't know, I've, I've been told that, you know, I may be the first a black man to independently do something like this, not only send it up, but to pay for it. So I'm very proud of that accomplishment. And you, and so I've been an entrepreneur for a long time. You know, that sometimes you just got to, you know, if you're going to actuate, you got to activate. And sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, you, you know, um, I can't tell you how many times I've been broke, but, you know, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not rich, but I'm not poor, but I'm in a position to help others. And that's what I've always wanted to do, to serve. So yeah, uh, yeah I like being a service leader. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I, I know I, I didn't expect for, for us to start preaching here, but, but I think we're there already, so we might as well continue. Um, but I, I think something you said uh, that was really, uh, really important was about uh, the importance of, of us, you know, uh, taking note of these moments and, and using them as examples for the next generation. And so I think, you know, something that's very important for us, especially during Black History Month, it's such an important time uh, for reflection uh, about the Black people who have paved the way for the work that we're able to do today. Um, and when we're discussing the history of space, uh, I think it's important for us to remember the people like Mae Jeminson, like Guillaume Bluford, like Leland Melvin. Uh, we can even go further back to people like, you know, Benjamin Banneker and Harriet Tubman, people who always look to the stars. I think in many ways, you know, Black people have always looked to the stars for freedom. Um, and so for both of you, um, how have your predecessors impacted your approach to engaging with space and to engaging in, in space science more broadly? Uh, Tierra, go ahead. Have we seen with the media, when we can see ourselves in something, it becomes more tangible? So by me seeing people who are doing what I wanted to do, well, you know, scratch that. By seeing people do something that I became interested in because they're doing it, it made my whole career. So people such as Mae Jeminson, the first Black female astronaut to go to space, she has always been my image of what I could be, what I will become. She was able to empower me just by walking in her shoes, just by doing what she loves to do. And what Topper is doing with the film, he's doing what he loves to do. And he's paving the way for more filmmakers to make contributions such as that. For Mae Jeminson, 
she was, you know, a dancer, astronaut, just this beautiful black representation of what an astronaut could be. When you think of an astronaut, you don't typically think of those faces on average, and that's because the representation is not presently there. There is a, a dominance of people who do not look like me, who do not look like us. Um, so it is up to us, it's our responsibility to push that forward. So in my passion as an aerospace engineer, I realize that when I look around me, there aren't many people who look like me. And I also realize that there is a responsibility to pull those upcoming generations forward, whether that's a short conversation, just talking about what I do, or even crafting opportunities for them to become more involved in aerospace, showing them what the opportunities look like, creating a footprint. But I'm able to do that because of the people before me. And I'm able to learn about those people before me because of media types. So even hidden figures, we all know about hidden figures. Um, that was my first time learning about those courageous women who went through what they had to go through just to follow their passions and dreams of being a mathematician, an aerospace engineer, um, an IT manager, all of these different things, all of these skills that they carry, but they had to literally break down doors in order to make it happen. They broke down the doors so that I can walk through them and widen the space even further because we still have a long way to go. I'll say it again. Uh, but they created the path in order for me to walk down it. So I'm forever indebted to all of the people in space who have came before me. Uh, uh, as I look forward, you know, um, I, uh, I'm very happy to be here with you two young people uh, because uh, uh, you are the future, and uh, just like you think about bringing young people along behind you, it makes me very comfortable to know that both of you are, you know, on the planet, uh, because I feel like uh, whatever work I have done will, you know, uh, you know, uh, have even more meaning if it has uh, in any way, you know, um, triggered you and uh, inspired you. Now, uh, we've all had, like you said, Tierra, uh, mentors, uh, some who we have touched and some who have touched us. Um, and I, as I look back, I think about my mother and father and my grandparents particularly. And I remember my grandfather saying to me one day, he said, look, 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 man, here's the deal. You're going to be different. So get ready, you know, and, uh, uh, and from, and he was my first great mentor. The first great um, uh, woman mentor I met was my grandmother who could fry one chicken and feed 11 people. She could fricassee it, she could barbecue it, she could stew it, she could make soup, she could do 20 zillion things with this one chicken. And she was the first great innovator I met, you know, and this is a woman from Virginia who only went to the fourth grade, you know, but, you know, she was the one who implanted the idea of pride in me. She lined up the Jet magazines, lined up the Ebony magazines, lined up the, you know, the Pittsburgh Courier, and she made sure we all sat down and read that. You know, so that's where I got political consciousness. And then, you know, uh, I got my cultural audacity from my grandfather, you know, who, you know, you know, made me do things that I never thought I could do. I couldn't buy toys. I had to make them, you know. And so I just want to say that, you know, innovation and invention you know, are going to fall into your lap, Tierra, that you got to respond to that. You're going to have to stand up to that, you know. And, you know, all of us have something that I call lace. It's a love for the children, you know. Uh, we, are, we are going to affirm them. Uh, we're going to provide them with cultural competency. And, and we're going to provide them with expectation in the space game. So, um, hey. 
I love both of you because, you know, I, I know what you're trying to do. I know what you want to do, and I know you will do. So uh, carry on. <laughs> we love you too, Toffer. Thank you so much. And that's that's just so inspiring. And, and, and um, yeah, no, it, it really means a lot to, to, to hear that coming from you. Um, and, and just a reminder to the audience, um, we are – we will be taking some questions um, at the end of uh, towards the end of our discussion. So please, if you do have questions uh, for Topper or Tierra, please make sure to drop them um, in the chat. Um, again, we are broadcasting this via YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. So on any of those platforms, you can drop in your comments or questions, and we will be able to see them and we'll be able to engage with them as well. So uh, just a reminder for for folks who are tuning in. Um, I think it's been very interesting hearing what both of you said around. Uh, the importance of representation, the importance of sort of, you know, having these models and these examples. Um, and one thing I think it's, you know, you can't talk about sort of our you know, black people's interest in space without talking about, you know, sort of how we conceptualize so many of these ideas through Afrofuturism, right? Um, whether that's in film, whether that's in books, um, whether that's even in music. Um, I think it's had uh, such a re resurgence in Afrofuturism, I think particularly over the you know, past few years uh, with films like, you know, Black Panther, obviously, with, you know, Beyonce's Black is King. Um, I don't know if you've, some of you have seen the Disney series, Kazazimoto, which is, you know, African animation studios producing, you know, these really beautiful, you know, stories. Um, and I think it's provided us a new visual language, a new visual approach to storytelling as well. Um, and I'd love to hear from both of you, why do you think you know, so many people have been attracted to these stories, to these the Afrofuturism, and, and how can we use these stories? When we're talking about Afrofuturism, we're looking at an expansion of what we can foresee as possible for Black people. So automatically, it's intriguing, it's tasteful, it's it's our imaginary coming into life. So when we talk about visionary fiction, that expansion of the mind, really thinking about, you know what, this hasn't happened in front of my eyes, but it's happened in my mind. And I would like to foresee what the future could look like. It just presents possibility. And where we're talking about possibilities, we're talking about creativity. And where we're talking about putting that action to creativity, we're then talking about innovation. So I believe that Afrofuturism puts us into a space of excitement. It puts our culture into a space of really seeing our creativity come to life. So I appreciate it. And I know that uh, my children, especially, they appreciate it. Um, being able to see someone such as Black Panther come into the screen, it, it gives you a new superhero. And it's not just a superhero who can fly. It's not just a superhero who's really fast. It's a superhero that has created a whole dynasty of possibility and innovation. And it's shown you what you may not necessarily see as possible right in front of your eyes, but it gives you that vision of what could be possible. So I appreciate every aspect of what Afrofuturism currently is and what it will develop into, because I see the opportunities as endless. I um, Thank you. I have a contextual basis and framework, which I have used for a while. Uh, uh, that uh, causes me to uh, time efficiently and, um, you know, uh, actuate a lot of the things that I do. Um, and I call it the, the history of Black America in 30 seconds. It's cultural audacity. It's creative bodacity. It's human capacity. It's political tenacity and its spiritual veracity. Now, uh, in our DNA, you know, due to our struggle, uh, uh, justice resides, change resides, and our willingness to, to, cha to, to challenge the status quo and as well as Eurocentric values. And so um, yeah, just think about uh, cultural audacity and having the audacity to challenge the institution of slavery. Uh, uh, just think about uh, creative audacity and the invention and the inventive innovation of things like jazz and 
uh, reggae and, you know, George Washington and Carver um, and the Williams sisters, you know, who changed the game of tennis and the slam dunk. There's all kinds of things. Also, you know, uh, Drew and others who have been scientific, who have been geniuses, by the way. Uh, and then you think about human capacity. You think about uh, Harriet Tubman, you know, you, and you think about uh, all of the warriors that we've seen and political tenacity, you know, and our, our ability to invent sit-ins and uh, boycotts and uh, a black power and a whole number of other things that have fallen into our lap and that have been inventions and innovations that have affected the change. Now, I think about Freedom Summer, which I was a part of. The Freedom Summer in 1964, led by Bob Moses and John Lewis, gave us the Voting Rights Act. Okay. Then you think about Selma and you think about um, uh, Birmingham, you know, uh, where SNCC, our organization, organized those things, and it gave us the Civil Rights Act. Now, uh, we are dynamic. We are powerful, we are beautiful, we're smart, you know, and we have managed to battle so many obstructions in our life, including space. We're going to be in space. Now, the American society's productivity is very, very, uh, 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 you know, not being smart when they, they underestimate, you know, us. But... <clears throat> That's got to change because if this country wants to continue to be productive and powerful, it has to draw on us. And you take a place like Spelman, I'm an HBCU boy, but you take a place like Spelman and you see how many women that has spawned. You And, and you take a look at Howard and you see how many engineers that has spawned, how many doctors, dentists and the rest. So we are very, 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 very gifted and very powerful people. We just have to accept and believe that. And, and with all the obstacles, there have been obstacles uh, to all of us, including uh, you, Ralph, you, Tierra, as we think about this space game. But we have embedded in our DA, DNA change and struggle. We're going to get through it. We're going to get by it. And, you know, your Biden would have won the last election if we hadn't been on, on board. So, you know, we're cool. I love Afrofuturism. And, you know, I specialize in innovation at MIT. You know, I like to know what's happening in the next four or five years. And I'd love to uh, take that information and that knowledge and transfer it to as many people as I can. You know, the HBCUs have been in, in very open and very receptive uh, to that. Uh, but, you know, uh, we must continue. And, you know, the struggle continues. And, you know, I say, uh, black to the future. <laughs> Thank you, Topper. Can you um, can you just repeat? I I, I love that uh, those three points that you made of cultural audacity, you said oh, spiritual veracity, and what's the third? I have to send you a book. It's five of them. Okay, uh, five of them. Okay. <laughs> let me repeat that because it's up on walls around the U.S. and it's something that I had to think about as a contextual basis, you know, for making decisions. Um, you know, not only just how I think, how I think, how I think about, you know, how I think about how I'm thinking about what I think about, but it's, it's cultural audacity. And, you know, if you go deep on that dive, you'll see a lot of beautiful things. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, 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 creative bodacity. I made up the word bodacity. That's what I'm <laughs> okay. But it's human capacity, right? Okay, it's political tenacity and it's spiritual veracity. Just think Dr. King, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so, you know, it, it, those five simple points make it easy to understand and cont contextualize the historical struggle of people in this country. And it's a beautiful thing because you can sit there and you can explain it. You can understand exactly where you are in history, you know. And then if you think about innovation. Look at all the innovation that's embedded in that. Miles Davis, huh? John Coltrane, really? You know, <laughs> you know, and and uh, you know, uh, Dr. Bass, you know, who, who, uh, cataracts, right? 
you know, uh, the Howard Law School, civil rights, you know, come on. So, you know, we, hey, we, we, we got something going on and, you know, uh, Thank you so much, Topper. Uh, so we're gonna uh, transition now to some questions um, from from our audience, and we have a question from YouTube. Um, Topper, uh, the question is for you, Topper. Um, what do you encourage teachers to do with your project? How would you like to see teachers engage with it um, with uh, with students in the classroom? Uh, yeah, I, I have several things um, that I've been thinking about with uh, with my partners, and one is. Um, in the classroom, we, we have the possibility to uh, uh, engage students in a, a launch simulation, you know, the launch of a rocket. You know, we can simulate that. Um, uh, we're going to the, the food growth systems that I talked about. Uh, uh, we have a, a space project that involves that, but it will ultimately uh, contribute to young people uh, uh, building and maintaining uh, food growth systems. Uh, we're going to teach kids to, to uh, build payloads. Now, I can't do this everywhere, you know, but so we can do it in some places, uh, but we can in inspire and we have a, and we have a space pedagogy uh, that uh, can be uh, dropped on teachers. And uh, the way that you know, uh, we would work as we would, uh, you know, train teachers. You know, that's how I have a, I have a, I founded a program at Google called Code Next. And, you know, it has a lab in the Google headquarters. And the idea behind that was uh, to teach uh, uh, computer science and fabrication uh, in the interest of uh, creating a new generation of engineers, architects, scientists, and now space people. Um, but it's a whole head in hand methodology, which is the pedagogy of MIT. So uh, there's a lab in uh, uh, in the, the Google headquarters in New York. It's in the Bay Area. It's in uh, Chapel Hill. And now one is being built in Detroit and in Los Angeles and in Atlanta, by the way, Ralph. Uh, but the idea is, is for people to get their hands on and to do it in a non-daunting way, but also give people academic enrichment. So, you know, by the end, but they come in in the eighth grade, you know, they finish in the 12th grade and they could go to work for Google. Uh, so, um, you know, it's it's like, you know, a lot of, of uh, footstools, you know, make step ladders. And, you know, every time you can, you know, get, 10, 20, 30, but now thousands of young people focused in, in, in the direction of up and forward and, um, you know, encourage them to be audacious and daring and courageous, you know. And, you know, the way we do that, you know, uh, is, you know, uh, a teacher like Tierra, you know, obviously loves those students. And she knows how to affirm those students. Uh, Ralph, uh, you know about cultural competency because you just sprung Afrofuturism on us in this conversation, <laughs> right? And then, uh, but you know, uh, Tierra and Ralph, and uh, you are setting expectations of possibility. You see, because there's been a culture of hopelessness. Now we know the struggle that inner cities go on, go got, and we're trying to cut through that. We're trying to show these young people possibilities. You don't just have to be a basketball player. You know what I mean? You know, you could be something else. You could be something special. And so I teach the science of basketball sometimes. And I, you know, my grandson is talking about an NBA. I'm saying, hey, but man, you could own a team. You know, uh, you could be a sports doctor, man. You could be a statistician. There's a, there's 20 things that you can be if you love basketball. So, no, if you don't get that scholarship or you don't get that NBA seat, you got 20 other things you can do because you got some other goals. So we have to go yeah. you know, in the expectation zone, Tierra, which you're doing. You know, I sit in books behind you. You know, you know, you you set in high expectation, and and Ralph, I know you you in Atlanta, man. I you know you know how Atlanta is, man. They, ascendancy is a thing. 
<laughs> Thank you so much, Topper. Um, and a question uh, for Tierra. Um, uh, can you uh, can you speak to what has been the most difficult thing you've had to do as an aerospace engineer, and what are you most proud of? Oh, that's a that's a question right there. Um, so I would say the most difficult thing that I've had to do as an aerospace engineer um, is getting over the imposter syndrome. Yes. Um, yeah, imposter syndrome is a bit too real, and although it's seemingly uncommon when the person is going through it, it is extremely common. Um, but imposter syndrome is feeling as though you're not enough or not capable mm -hmm. enough in order to achieve a goal. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, going throughout my education, even while I was at MIT for undergrad, um, while I was at Duke for my master's, I'm currently getting my doctorate from University of Southern California. Um, I've had to peel back that imposter syndrome, but I have to be real and say that it creeps up. And I have to then attack it face on over and over and over. It's a process instead of a one-time feat. Uh, but I think that people should know that if you're going through imposter syndrome, you're not alone. Um, a lot of people do it, no matter what their role is, no matter what their title is, no matter if they're a rocket scientist, aerospace engineer, whatever it is. Um, I go through it. People go through it. Um, so that's been the biggest feat has been getting over the hurdle of myself, um, as that's what I really call it, is the hurdle of myself. Yeah. But I would say that my greatest achievement, though, um, is getting over that hurdle. <laughs> um, once I was able to get over that hurdle, I was then able to have the confidence in myself that I didn't have to depend on other people to have for me. Because the thing I was talking about doors earlier. Um, you have the folks who break down the doors for you, but you also have the folks who won't open the door and you have to open it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so I've had to make that step quite a few times in my career. Um, I'm currently a program manager and site project engineer, but I started out as a structural analysis early career engineer. So there were a lot of different barriers that I had to overcome to make it to where I am today. So did that include points of racism, points of sexism? points of ageism, all of the different isms that are placed against me because of my positionality in society, you can say, yes, I'm considered young, especially for the aerospace engineering field. I, I am black. I am a woman. Um, so with that triad, I've had to embrace it first and foremost, bring my culture into the workplace, not shy away from it and come in and walk as an authentic leader. We talked about being a servant leader. You have to be an authentic leader. You have to be a transformational leader in some places in order to get the culture into where it needs to be. We talked about equitable spaces that comes with the authenticity, with the transformation and with the servitude in order to make that happen. Um, so I've had to go through transformations within myself to overcome the hurdle of myself uh, to make it to where I am today. And I'm very proud of that feat. And it's a hurdle that I still go over because, you know, when you're running a marathon and you have to jump over those hurdles, they keep coming. But in order to make it to the finish line, I know that I just have to keep jumping and running. So that's where I'm at. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, praise. Praise. <laughs> So we're gonna, I mean, we're gonna close out now. And I just wanna ask each of you, um, I feel like this this entire, uh, you know, past, you know, 45 minutes or so has been all about, you know, I mean, just incredible words of wisdom, but um, any, really briefly, any last words of wisdom and encouragement that you have, uh, that both of you have for the young dreamers out there who are looking to the stars? Um, I would say, that uh, whatever, whatever I have done and whatever I do is not without faith. And I say that, and you know, I don't often say this publicly, uh, but you know, the, the, the the first thing in life I wanted to be was a priest when I was 13. But then when I was 14, I discovered girls. So I had to put that on the shelf for a minute. I said, God, please, you know, understand what my dilemma is. 
Uh, but I have always had very strong faith and I've always believed that um, it, somewhere in the spiritual universe, man, an energy comes through me and that I believe quite honestly that my work is my ministry. And uh, I'm not shy about that because uh, there have been times when you ask how, what, you know, how are you going to get this done? And I understand that imposter thing because I used to talk to students at MIT about it all the time. And I say, but, you know, you're here and you just have to, you know, uh, uh, pray for that energy, for that intention. And that intention has what has been fueling me for so long and uh, allowed me to do many of the things that I've done and continue to do. So uh, uh, that's what I say, man. You know, uh, think about how you're thinking, about what you're thinking about, and every time you will get a different result. And then uh, give more creativity uh, to the actuation that leads to the materialization of an idea than you uh, necessarily have to give to the idea itself. And then on every occasion, you will yield a more interesting and innovative result. Yeah. Thank you so much, Topper. Absolutely. Sierra, how about you? Yes. Faith is at the center, the forefront, the yeah. meat of uh, my entire life, every aspect. Um, it's the front end of Rocket with the Fletchers. Faith, love, and rockets. Um, so when I when I give advice to folks who are looking to achieve their dreams, of course you can imagine I like to connect it to space and I think it's only appropriate in this conversation. Um, but I always say that when you are looking to get a rocket into space, you need the right fuel. You need the right impulse. We talked about actuation, so we're kind of on a trend here. Um, but I would just encourage everyone to fuel your dreams. So you have to define what that fuel looks like. That fuel should be the empowerment, the confidence, the faith, the willingness, the motivation, the inspiration, all of those different contributors, those ingredients in order to make your fuel more efficient. And then you need to achieve your dream. If you can dream it, you can achieve it. We've talked about visionary fiction. We've talked about what we've done as a culture that was not a thing yet, that was not possible. Freedom was not possible, but it was brought into fruition because of the vision that people had in order to carry it through. And because of the ingredients that they put in their fuel in order to make those dreams come to life. So I would encourage you to fuel your dreams and make it to your destination. One, one last little thing, Ralph. Uh, uh, Nobody plays to win and thinks about losing. And the hardest roads are often the roads worth choosing. And one day you'll look back and smile and think it was worth every mile. Thank you all so much. Um, wow, I am... Uh... Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to go out there and get it. I don't know about y'all at home who are tuning in, but but if that, you know, I, I know that did a number on me and, and with regards to uh, just hearing y'all stories, uh, just hearing the the amount of uh, of just you know of work, the amount of of faith, the amount of just um, passion and love for for the for what you all do for your people, for the community that you all serve. Uh, that has been just so inspiring to hear and. And thank you all both for uh, for being here with us. Uh, thank you all uh, who have been tuning in. Um, thank you, Black Event Media, for hosting this wonderful space for us to have this conversation. I hope you leave it feeling inspired. Um, please, again, go check out this little light of mine in space. Um, check it. Make sure that you know when that thing comes around to your region, you tune in and you get inspired too by the song um, and by its message. Um, and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Uh, enjoy the rest of Black History Month. Learn something new. Uh, learn about your, your predecessors and your ancestors and 
and what they have done to, to create a pathway for you. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you again, Tiara. Thank you, Topper, for joining us. It's been uh, an incredible hour of conversation um, and an inspiration as well.